Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Mike Rowicki. Um, I'm the state representative here in Putney. And uh, one of the things that uh, I try and do, and I think all legislators try and do, is, is keep our ear to the ground for, for what's happening. And most of the time, you people are more adept at that than us, and we follow you, and then you call us leaders. But if we're listening well, I think we're doing our work. And the reason we're, we're here tonight looking at this topic is because the more people I talk to, the more I get around, the more I see how prevalent Lyme and tick-borne diseases are. It's really an epidemic, and I don't think we're talking about it enough. I know in the legislature, we're not talking about it at all, really. And this is the start of a process, I think, to get more legislators to understand what a problem this is and what we might do. Uh, we're going to start with Bradley Tompkins, who's from the Vermont Department of Health. Before I turn it over to him, though, I just wanted to introduce Kathleen O'Neill here from the Brattleboro Department of Health. And this is one of the areas she focuses on. At some point in time, you may run into her or she may be helping you. And I just wanted to uh, introduce her so if you do, you've got a familiar face you're going to now. Um, tonight's program is going to be, uh, Bradley's going to take about 20 minutes to share what, what he has from the, for the Vermont Department of Health, looking at this as a public health problem. And then what I'd like to do is, is hear from you hear what your stories are, your experience, and any suggestions you might have for how we can help people better. So uh, thanks again for coming. And Bradley, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me here tonight. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Bradley. And um, Kathleen and I are colleagues at the, the health department. Uh, Kathleen is down here in Brattleboro, whereas I'm up at the uh, headquarters in Burlington but um, Kathleen does all of our uh, tick-borne investigations. So anytime somebody has a tick-borne disease that gets reported to the health department and they live in this part of the state, Kathleen is the go-to person to do that investigation. So a lot of the data that I'm gonna be sharing with you tonight uh, comes from um, public health nurses like Kathleen and her colleagues across the state that collect this information and then um, filter it us, up to us at the health department. And so. Um, again, thank you for, for having me and thank you for, for coming out tonight. Um, what I want to do is just go through some of the, the very basics about the latest information we know about tick-borne diseases in Vermont and give you some tips at the end, which I'm sure a lot of you are probably already aware of, about prevention. Um, so we actually have 13 different types of ticks in Vermont, um, but there's only five of those out of the 13 that actually bite humans. Um, four of those are um, actually capable of spreading disease to humans, but only one tick is responsible for all of the tick-borne disease that we see here in Vermont, and that's the black-legged tick. This tick is responsible for transmitting five different diseases in the state. These are the ones I'm going to focus on tonight. Anaplasmosis, Babesiosis, Borrelia miyamotoi, Lyme disease, which is, I'm sure, the one that most people are familiar with, and then also Powassan virus disease. And um, it's important to, to point out here at the beginning that um, tick-borne diseases are actually what we call zoonotic diseases. Um, it's actually animals out in nature that are responsible for maintaining the bacteria and the viruses and the parasites that then get transmitted to us by ticks. So it's these creatures and lots of other ones who actually maintain the pathogen out in the community and ticks pick it up from them and then they spread it on to us. So although we're talking about these all as tick-borne diseases, we need to keep in mind that you know, nature being interconnected the way it is, there's actually a lot of different animals that play a role in the problems associated with tick-borne diseases. So when are Vermonters at risk? Tick-borne disease um, you know, used to be thought of mostly as a spring and summertime um, um, threat that you had to be aware of, 
but in fact, um, ticks are actually active at two different times of year. In the spring and summer here where we see this peak in May, June, and July, and then again in October and November. So in this time of year, you've got your nymphal ticks. These are the ones that are very, very small, the size of a poppy seed that are coming out and feeding. These are the ones that are feeding right now. And in the autumn, it's adults that come out. So the nymphs that are feeding right now, they get that blood meal. They use September and August, August and September to molt into adults. And then they come out for one more meal in the fall. So this is actually a graph of um, Vermont emergency room visits that are due to any sort of tick encounter. So they're not due to whether or not somebody's got Lyme disease or has got anaplasmosis. It's if somebody comes in and says, I've got a tick on me, can you remove it? Or I removed a tick and the mouth parts are still in there, can you help me? So this gives us a really quick and dirty sense of how busy tick season is this year compared to last year. We can kind of tell where we are in tick season. And so this is our historic average. This is the kind of activity we've seen over the last um, dozen years or so. And when we look at it this year, um, this data is as recent as last week. You can see so far it's been an above average year for Vermonters going to emergency rooms across the state uh, for some sort of tick issue. Um, so we've been above average. If there's any good news in this graph, it's that we're now on the downside of things. So those nymphs, a lot of them have fed. They're gonna start um, going back under the leaf litter and growing into adults. So in August and September, we're gonna get a little bit of a reprieve from all the ticks being out. So where in Vermont um, are Vermonters most at risk? So you can get a tick-borne disease in any part of the state, but there are um, certain spots where the um, burden of disease is higher. It's certainly here in the southern part of the state. Bennington County has the highest incidence of tick-borne disease. That's Lyme and anaplasmosis and babesiosis. But here we are in Wyndham County. You can see that that's also dark green. So there's a lot of tick-borne disease activity here in this part of the state. And you can see kind of as you go north, the shade of green gets a little bit lighter, meaning there's less tick-borne disease activity. And um, in the Northeast Kingdom, um, it's kind of like the last bastion of very little tick-borne disease in the state. Um, when we do some fancy statistical analysis and look at hot spots, you can see we've got um, a big hot spot for tick-borne disease on the other side of the Green Mountains here in Bennington County and um, Southern Rutland County. And we've got a bit of a cold spot here in some of the upper elevations uh, where we get more mountainous and towards the Northeast Kingdom. Generally, ticks don't like to live above 500 meters. So when you get higher up in elevation, you're gonna find less ticks, less tick-borne disease. So um, I just wanna talk about uh, five uh, different diseases here, just some basics for all of them, um, and go through them in order of their prevalence here in the state. So number one is of course Lyme disease. It's caused by a bacteria, it's called Borrelia burgdorferi. Um, an interesting thing about it is even though Lyme disease was discovered in the 70s and early 80s, the bacteria has actually been here longer than we have. It's been here for at least 20,000 years before the last ice age. The transmission time, um, this is something that's a little bit unique to Lyme disease is that it can take a little while for um, the pathogen to get from the tick into your body, um, 24 to 48 hours, somewhere in that range. Um, this pattern here holds true for Vermont and the rest of the country. The kids between the ages of five and 14 are at greatest risk for Lyme disease and so are adults um, age 50 or older. There's none of those here, so you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're all young crowd here. Um, some of the common symptoms for Lyme disease, um, this EM rash, it's, it's an erythema migraines rash, which means it's a rash that, that migrates. Um, it's the most common symptom that we see in Lyme disease patients in Vermont, um, but you don't see it all of the time. We see it in about 70% of cases. Um, Perhaps some people have it on a part of their body that they can't see, or perhaps they don't develop that sort of rash at the site of a tick bite. But it is what physicians are looking for to clinically diagnose somebody with Lyme disease. Um, and you can see a lot of the other symptoms are generally pretty vague. Joint swelling, 
fatigue, joint pain, fever, sweats and chills, muscle pain, headache, neck pain. Um, this last one, we don't see all that often Bell's palsy. This is a, a temporary paralysis of the uh, facial muscle, muscles. Um, it can be one side or it can be both sides. Um, but again, thankfully we don't see that that often here in Vermont. Um, again, this EM rash, which, you know, traditionally people have said, it, you know, you have to have an EM rash to have Lyme disease. We know that's not true. Again, about three out of four people do have this rash, but if you don't have a rash and you've got some of these other symptoms, that doesn't necessarily mean you don't have Lyme disease. And that's an important thing to know. Um, at the health department, we, we measure um, the severity of disease in infectious diseases by how often people get hospitalized with it. If there is um, any good news about Lyme disease is that the hospitalization rate is relatively low. Of course, we'd love to see it at zero, but 4% um, isn't that bad, especially when you compare it to some of the other diseases we're gonna be talking about tonight. Um, the disease is curable with antibiotics, but people are going to have a better outcome with Lyme disease and avoid having longer term symptoms if they get diagnosed and get, get treated quickly. So that's why being cognizant of these symptoms, uh, knowing your risk is really important so that you can get diagnosed and treated quickly and effectively. Anaplasmosis is number two. Can I just get a show of hands? Who's heard of anaplasmosis? Okay, great. So this is a disease we've been trying to raise a lot more awareness about because it's become increasingly common. Um, it's also caused by a bacteria. This one can be transmitted quicker than Lyme disease. So they say, you know, it's anywhere from 24 to 48 hours for Lyme. It's been shown that anaplasmosis can be um, transmitted quicker, maybe in as quick as 24 hours. And unlike um, Lyme disease, the people who are most at risk for anaplasmosis are our are all older adults, 50 years of age or older. We see very, very little anaplasmosis in young children or middle-aged adults. Again, the symptoms, they're pretty vague. There's nothing that's going to scream out at you that says, you know, I've got anaplasmosis. Fever, malaise, muscle aches, headache, nausea and vomiting are a little bit unique for a tick-borne disease. Um, but again, fatigue, some people might have a rash, but it's really rare in anaplasmosis. So if you want to get diagnosed with this, you really need a laboratory test to get that. Um, so when we talked about Lyme having a relatively small hospitalization rate, 31% of people in Vermont with anaplasmosis get hospitalized. That's an enormous number. That's a really high number that really concerns us. These people, um, not that you're not very sick with Lyme disease, but these people are acutely ill with anaplasmosis and require some intensive care. Brad? Yes, sir. Is that because the, the symptoms are that much more severe? They're that much more severe, and the Lyme bacteria, Borrelia burgdorferi, likes to get in, it likes to be in your joint fluid, um, whereas anaplasmosis, uh, not only does it get into your body, but then it also invades your cells, your white blood cells, and can end up um, destroying some of them. So um, it's what's called a rickettsial disease in that it has to live inside of your blood cells. Very nasty disease. Um, if your doctor doesn't know whether you're dealing with Lyme or you're dealing with anaplasmosis and they're going to test you and it's going to take a couple of days, the good news is that anaplasmosis can be treated with the same Back, same antibiotic that can treat Lyme disease. So they can treat you not knowing which one it is and cover both. Um, so if we look at the trend in these tick-borne diseases, you can see in 2008, we had about 400 cases of Lyme disease in the state. And last year was the first year we broke over a thousand cases. Um, anaplasmosis, um, we had you know three, two, four cases when we first started doing surveillance for this disease in 2008 and last year we had close to 400. So just to sort of set the context for these other diseases I'm gonna talk about, um, babesiosis is the third most common tick-borne disease and you can see how much um, less frequent it is in Vermont than um, Lyme or anaplasmosis is. But it is a, a serious disease and it is here, so I do wanna make sure that, that we cover it a little bit. 
Um, the symptoms of babesiosis, again, they're, they're pretty generic and you're not gonna be able to tell, oh, I'm dealing with anaplasmosis or babesiosis from this. Fever, headache, chills, um, body aches, nausea, appetite loss is a little bit unique. We don't see a lot of people with Lyme or anaplasmosis um, just losing their appetite, but it can happen with babesiosis and people just feel exhausted. Um, anaplasmosis is supposed to come on and hit you like a train all of a sudden. Babesiosis is supposed to be more of a slow rolling disease where you feel progressively worse and worse. Um, again, it's got a pretty high hospitalization rate. 31% of Vermonters end up hospitalized because they've got babesiosis. And the tricky thing about this for medical providers is that it's not caused by a bacteria like Lyme disease or anaplasmosis was. This one's caused by a parasite. And because of that, it requires a different treatment than Lyme disease, anaplasmosis, or the next one I'm gonna talk about, Borrelia miyamotoi. And unfortunately, we do see that from time to time is that somebody is diagnosed with babesiosis and they're just treated with routine sort of antibiotics because it's just another tick-borne disease and they end up being sick for a longer period of time because they didn't get the, the required treatment or the necessary yeah, treatment. What, what would the treatment be? It's a combination of an antiparasitic and an antibiotic. Mm -hmm. Yes. And clinomycin, mm -hmm. yeah. It's really gross. Um, the fourth most common one is Borrelia miyamotoi. This one is brand new. We didn't even, this disease was discovered in 1995, first um, discovered to cause human illness in Russia in 2011 and the first U.S. case was um, found in New Jersey in 2013. Three years later, we had our first case in Vermont. Um, again, it's caused by a bacteria. Um, the transmission can hap happen faster than it can for Lyme disease. So we're not looking at one to two days that the tick has to be attached. It could be 24 hours. Again, the symptoms, they're pretty vague. Fever, muscle aches, fatigue, joint ache. Um, sometimes the fever is relapsing, so people might have a fever, then it might go away, and then the fever comes back, then it goes away again. That's one kind of telltale sign, but um, not a lot of people really uh, recognize that. So you really need another laboratory test to differentiate this disease from the other ones. Um, <coughs> since it's a new disease, there hasn't been a lot of diagnostic testing available. It was really one specialty lab um, in Massachusetts that was testing for this a couple of years ago. But now um, there are more tests available um, through big commercial laboratories. So we are seeing more hospitals and more doctors testing for this disease. Um, and again, because it's caused by a bacteria, the same antibiotic that can be used against Lyme disease or anaplasmosis can be used with Borrelia miyamotoi. So if your doctor doesn't know what it is of these three that they're dealing with, they can treat you with an antibiotic and it'll cover all three. The last one is Powassan virus. This one caused a lot of um, uproar last year, was in the news a lot. Um, it's the only tick-borne disease we have in Vermont that's caused by a virus. Everything else before was caused by a bacteria or a parasite. This one's transmitted very quickly. That's part of the reason why it garners so much news attention, maybe in as little as 15 minutes wow. from the time a tick bites you to the time the virus gets into your bloodstream. It's also a little scary because there's no treatment available because it's a virus and it's got a 10% fatality rate. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't had a case here in Vermont since 1999, but that's probably because it, it's very difficult to diagnose. It's probably been undiagnosed and unreported. We do know that the virus is here because we picked it up in a small number of ticks. Um, and this here shows you last year where all the Powassan virus cases happened in the country. You can see we were basically surrounded by uh, states that had Powassan virus. And it's in fact named for a town in Ontario. Um, so we, we definitely know that the virus is here. Thankfully, you know, we, we haven't had any cases how is that reported. That is diagnosed through special testing facilitated through the health department, um, done at Fort Collins CDC. There are no commercial or clinical labs that test for Powassan virus. So the CDC can do what you're saying if they feel as a chance to have it? Yes, so actually we have a website on healthvermont.gov. If a provider thinks they've got a patient with Powassan virus, they contact us. We kind of clear the testing and then we facilitate the specimen making its way out to Colorado for testing.
Yep. Um, we had about seven people tested for Powassan virus last year. None of them came back positive. So what were the symptoms? These people have got either meningitis or encephalitis. They are not conscious. They're on, you know, uh, a high intensity of um, support. Um, this isn't, you know, like Lyme. You come in and you feel awful. You get a blood test and you go home. These people are hospitalized and um, very, very sick. Um, so I just want to wrap up here talking about um, pr preventing these diseases because as much as the graphs show the, the diseases, the number of cases going up um, and the news not looking that good, these are preventable diseases. Um, and the best thing to do is to take personal protective measures. We have a motto at the health department, protect, check, remove, and watch. So the first step, uh, step is protecting yourself. Wear pants and long sleeves if you're outside because that creates a physical barrier between you and the ticks so they can't get to your skin. Um, have it be light colored clothing if possible because that of course makes it easier to see a tiny little black legged tick on your clothes. Um, if it's too warm or you just feel like you know wearing shorts and a t-shirt, um, use a safe and effective tick repellent on your exposed skin. Um, we really want people to use things that have been tested and shown to be both safe and effective. So the EPA has got a really good website where um, you can go and you can type in, I want to repel ticks and I'm going to be outside for six hours. And it'll give you a list of all of the commercial products and the active ingredients that are in there that will um, repel ticks for you. So if you want to avoid DEET, DEET is the recommended active ingredient. There was a, um, a story on the news last night on uh, Channel 5, uh, Consumer Reports found that a study and said DEET is the most effective, but there's other things like picaridin or oil of lemon eucalyptus that have also been shown to be safe and effective. This website will tell you both the commercial product name, so whether it's off or something like that, and also the active ingredient that's in there so you can pick which one works for you. There's another chemical you can spray on your clothing. You can't put it on your skin, but you can put it on your clothing. It's called permethrin. Um, it repels ticks a little bit, but what it really does is it kills them. That's why you can't put it on your skin because it'll get absorbed by your skin. But if you spray it on your clothes, you let your clothes dry, then it's safe for you to wear them. Uh, but it's not gonna be safe for any ticks that get on there. Um, the nice thing about it also is that it's good for several wash cycles, so you don't have to reapply this permethrin compound every time you wash and dry your clothes. You can buy pre-treated clothing. Um, and again, you can't apply it to your skin. You can just put it on um, your clothing. You can put it on your shoes, on your socks, your pants. You can put it on your camping or your hunting gear, whatever you've got outside with you. Um, and when you're out shopping, if you haven't used the EPA website, you just look on the back for an EPA registration number and it'll tell you that the product's been registered with EPA. We also want you to check yourself for um, ticks after coming indoors. Permethrin, um, D, picaridin are all great products, but nothing to 100%. So check yourself, check your spouse, your partner, your roommate um, in parts of their body where they might not be able to see ticks that well. <clears throat> um, and then if you do happen to find a tick on you, we want you to remove it promptly and correctly. So um, we don't want you to do anything to risk your, um, increase your risk of infection. So you just grab a tick by um, as close to your skin as possible. You pull straight up and uh, you remove the tick and discard it. There's a lot of stuff out there that says, oh, you use nail polish remover or you light a match and blow out the flame and use the hot match on the tick. All those things um, could irritate the tick, make it regurgitate whatever it's got in its stomach into you already. So you don't need a special tool or anything like that, just a nice pair of tweezers, pull straight up and discard the tick. Clean the bite area afterwards with soap and water or alcohol. That's not gonna prevent you from getting a, a tick-borne disease, but if you've got an open wound, you know we want you to um, clean it up. You can also put your clothes in the dryer for 10 minutes on high as soon as you get in, and that'll kill any ticks that are remaining on your clothes. The recommendation used to be put your clothes in the washer, then you put them in the dryer, like your traditional sort of washing routine to kill the ticks. But the, the trick is ticks don't like heat and they don't like dryness. So if you put them directly in the dryer, you're gonna desiccate them pretty quickly and they're gonna die in a matter of 10 minutes. 
So that's another trick you can use. Um, and then we want you to watch for symptoms. Um, again, they're all pretty vague, so you're not necessarily gonna know what you're dealing with, but um, if you've got these kind of vague symptoms, particularly in the spring or summer months, um, you know, flu, we have a, like a flu season, which is the winter, of course, but flu actually circulates all year round. It's just way more common in the winter. But um, if you feel flu-like, if you feel achy and fatigued, and you've got a fever in May, June, and July, and you live in Vermont, particularly if you spend a lot of time outdoors, you should really be thinking tick-borne disease. You should go see your healthcare provider. Tell them about your outdoor activities. If you don't remember having a tick bite, if you do remember having a tick bite, tell them that. Try to you know help them along in the diagnosis. Um, and then I've got an example of some of the stuff that we have here, but really raising awareness and educating people about tick-borne diseases is the best tool that we have in our toolbox right now. So what we spend a lot of our efforts on at the health department are raising awareness and educating people. We've got a lot of material that you can order for free from our website. We've got posters and booklets and cards, um, stickers. Um, we do an annual report so you can see the latest information on tick-borne diseases in the state. We try to update our website pretty regularly with data. And then we've um, also got some high, some targeted materials this year. Um, for kids, we're trying to um, encourage kids to be tick detectives. Since they're at greater risk for Lyme disease, uh, we want kids to um, be checking for ticks and tell an adult if they find a tick on them. And then our older Vermonters, 50 years of age and older, who are um, more risk for anaplasmosis. We've got posters uh, that we're trying to distribute this year to try to raise awareness about anaplasmosis. And um, so that's it. This is our website, healthvermont.gov slash btixsmart. You can order these materials for free. Um, again, thank you everybody for coming out and um, I'm gonna hand it over to Representative Rowicki. I think what I'd like to do is Bradley can take, take a few questions and then maybe we could have a little bit of discussion so I can try and hear some of what you've experienced and maybe some suggestions as next steps that we can take uh, as a group in the state. I have a question. Um, <clears throat> I just want to say that as I sit listening to you, I found myself getting more and more angry. And um, I think that a lot of what you said, I just feel like it's a little bit of a whitewash because from the very beginning, the diagnosis is very poor, and we know that. Uh, because I've talked to my doctor, and she said that the blood test for Lyme is only 30 to 50% effective. And also to say, oh, let's be aware, and you know, tick detectives, I don't buy that either, because I have friends at work in the woods, and even wearing the clothing that had that permethrin or whatever embedded in it, and all the stuff they did, they ended up with Lyme. This is a public health hazard, just as much as if we had Zika and mosquitoes here. So my only question tonight, what is the state doing to get rid of the ticks? And if the answer is nothing, what can we do to put political pressure so that they do something about it? Because I feel the idea of, oh, let's just be aware, and oh, sorry, that doesn't cut it. This is a really serious health hazard. I feel less safe here than I feel going to the Amazon where I'm going at the end of this month. Yeah. Judith, that's kind of why I wanted to bring people together yeah. here. Because uh, we're not talking about this at the State House. And, when I look at the problem, one of the pieces of the equation uh, that I think we should start looking at is how do we reduce the tick population? Absolutely. And uh, yeah. so the way we can help generate that is, is to gather information. The Department of Health is, is gathering data that we can use, but I think as much as data is helpful, uh, stories are more helpful too. So what we want to do is hear people's experiences, suggestions and and that way we can build support because I don't think it's just happening here but I think what we can do is start the momentum here to because uh, as you sh showed on this is happening across the state right There's it is yeah certainly southern Vermont is um, for lack of a better term the epicenter and it has been but we are seeing a sort of general trend where the diseases are spreading northward for instance, we think that you know Addison and Orange counties are probably next for getting hit with Lyme disease the way that Windsor and Bennington and Rutland counties have been hit in the past and are getting hit now. Um, so the, just to, to your point or your questions, 
The Lyme test is the only one here that's based on serology. So that means that they're not detecting the actual pathogen in you. They're detecting your body's response to it. And you're absolutely right. The, um, if, you, if you show up to your doctor's office when you are acutely sick with Lyme disease, um, say within the first week, you, might, you will likely end up negative on that test because your body does not, um, does not create an antibody response to the, the pathogen quickly enough. You might not be positive for a week or two or three weeks later. So there are um, you know, studies being done to look for uh, better testing for that. A lot of these other diseases are tested through a PCR technology where they're looking directly for the DNA. So I hear you that patients aren't crazy about the test. Physicians often get confused by it. It's not easy for us to interpret at the health department either, but I do want you to know that we do take these diseases seriously. Um, that's part of the reason why we're investing a lot of money in this. And awareness, we can get into this a little bit l later, but um, we focus a lot on awareness and education because at this point, it's the only thing that's been shown to actually be um, effective at reducing people's risk. But we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, you mentioned that uh I'm not going to bother with the kids because I don't see too many in this room, but the, the 50 plus mm -hmm. is more susceptible or has more reported cases of, um, of Lyme. Do we understand the reasons why? Is that because their kids are out in the, the woods, middle ages are working and the older people are, are less <laughs> likely to be working and more likely in the woods? Or is there a I think kids are definitely at greater risk because they're outside and doing a lot of this stuff. I don't know necessarily why you see the dip in the middle-aged um, and young adults, and then you see an increase again in older adults. A lot of the infectious diseases we deal with, anaplasmosis in particular, likes to take advantage of people who are um, older or have an, uh, some sort of compromised immune system or they're fighting some sort of other health issue. So that could you know, be a part to explain why we see more Lyme disease in older adults than we do in younger and middle-aged ones. Um, having said that, we see plenty of 20 and 30 year olds with Lyme disease in Vermont. It's not like we do with anaplasmosis where there's virtually nobody. Everybody in Vermont gets Lyme disease. It's just these older individuals and the younger ones are at higher risk. Did you just say everyone in Vermont gets Lyme disease? Oh, across all age groups. Oh. Yes. <laughs> yeah, sorry. No. You just don't know yet. You have it. <laughs> My doctors don't like the test. Yes. Um, there's the tick that bit you that you never saw. That's a problem. Mm -hmm. But if you have a tick attached to you, I really firmly believe that having that tick tested will give you an advantage. And I'm going to explain that my husband got a tick bite 50 feet from this building, and it had anaplasma in it. He was given two doxycycline, the recommended prophylactic dose, which I actually heard on the tick-borne disease working group, one of the last meetings they had, that if the tick that bit you has those two diseases, the efficacy of those two doxycycline go down 20 to 20 percent. Mm -hmm. And so he was bitten, and exactly 14 days later, he couldn't walk. Mm -hmm. And he was asking for crutches, and I was laughing, because we knew that that tick had anaplasma in it and that he needed to go on doxycycline immediately. So I don't understand why the state of Vermont doesn't recommend that people go ahead and have that tick tested if they have one attached to them. It just doesn't make any sense to me. I understand the one that got away, the one that got me got away, never saw it, but um, that the, when my husband got bit, the last one that bit my family, I have sent it to UMass. They had 160 ticks that day because it was the middle of November. Mm. And that's when the adults are out. So I think people really need to understand that October and November are really dangerous months. Um, the last talk, you said that people should um, spray their shoes, and you had a percentage of how effective that was with permethrin. I think I sprayed all my shoes. I don't spray my sandals, but um, in terms of killing ticks, if permethrin will kill them, 
if you wear permethrin treated clothing, you are doing that job. I want to tell you, I have these little leggings and the skirt, which is treated with permethrin, and I am killing ticks all day long. Yeah, permethrin is, right? is going to it's going to disrupt their um, their movement. They're going to become sort of paralyzed and maybe fall off. And if they're in contact with it long enough, they're going to they die. And they won't climb up on you. They'll jump off. Right. If somebody comes, brings a tick to your office, can you test it? No, we don't test it. Um, that tick testing, the tick might have anaplasma, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you do. You might have anaplasma because you might have had another tick bite and you didn't see the tick. That might not do you as, as well as monitoring your health. And as soon as you show symptoms, go to the doctor well, I, or your I practitioner. I agree you should do both. Yeah, do both. Um, the other thing that you said was um, that the recommended treatment is 200 milligrams of doxycycline, and, and it is two doxycycline. Yeah, it's not. It's um, we don't do that in one day. No, because if they give you the 200 milligrams of doxycycline, it can knock the symptoms back, and it could mask that you actually have anaplasma. So the doctors or, aren't doing that anymore. So, well, it's I'm not going to speak for the doctors, oh, okay. but it's not yeah. recommended from the CDC. It is something that some practitioners have been doing, but it's really the full. Once you um, are known to have a tick-borne disease, it's really the full um, two to three weeks. Yeah. Right. Well, I'm glad to hear that, because I did hear that as well. But I know that doctors like to treat a tick bite with two doxycycline. Right. I think that was more for Lyme, too, if I'm right, the 200 milligrams for, for Lyme. Disease. Yeah, that, that's one reason why we don't make that a big, I mean, we don't get into the medical advice necessarily here, but it's a big reason why we don't focus on that when we talk to providers is because that was one study that was done with Lyme disease, this whole idea of a prophylactic dose of doxycycline. And they showed for the, the reasons that, that Kathleen was illustrating, you have, to, you have to treat 39 people like that to prevent one case of Lyme disease. And doxycycline isn't without its own side effects as well. But what gives us pause more than anything is the rise of these other tick-borne diseases. There's nothing out there that says that a prophylactic dose of doxycycline is going to prevent anaplasmosis. It certainly won't do anything against babesiosis. And we, you know, we were only three years into knowing anything about Borrelia miyamotoi here in the state. So we, you know, it gives us pause to um, encourage people to perhaps have a, a false sense of security by getting um, a prophylactic dose and thinking that they're going to be okay when, in fact, we don't know that they will. Do you have a question over here? Um, yeah. Just sort of as a follow-up to that, you're talking about all this outreach and education, and how much of that are you doing with the healthcare providers? Because uh, I, it, when in talking to people, I think um, we've all had experiences with doctors who seem to have widely varying approaches to this, yeah. opinions, and so on. And that's a little scary that it's luck of the draw which provider you pick as to what what treatment you might get. So are you really doing a big push of education for healthcare providers? Yeah, over the last couple of years we've done, um, we've done uh, one, we did one daily session, like a half a Saturday for providers on um, tick-borne disease diagnosis and treatment, particularly Lyme disease. Um, but that's, it's been half a Saturday and kind of moving around the state and we've wanted to, um, reach a wider audience. So actually right now, we're in the finishing touches of um, having like an online CME uh, continuing education type course for providers. So no matter where you are in Vermont, no matter what time, you know, what day of the week or what time it is, you can go in and you can view this, um, this course that's taught by infectious disease physicians here in Vermont to learn about the diagnosis and treatment for these diseases. So it's been an, an ongoing effort and we're trying to make it wider now. Um, and then aside from that, we've you know, spent a lot of time at hospitals um, uh, going out to, I think I had a colleague at North, at, in Newport today. I was at NVRH earlier. Um, so when providers do come to us, we you know, go out and, and talk to them about tick-borne diseases. But we think this online way is a much easier way for them to get this kind of information rather than just having it, you know, once a day, once a year in one part of the state. So that's, it's, um, <clears throat> it's an issue that we recognize and we're trying to put more focus on as well. And we're not the, the health department isn't necessarily the best people to educate 
medical providers because you know we're not a medical institution we're public health but we can facilitate that and that's what we're trying to do so we like work with the best infectious disease physicians in the state try to bring them together for this initiative and they're on board with it and hopefully it'll be out and pretty soon did you have a question? Yes. well I've seen a couple physicians lately who think it's not a, a, that big a deal well the last one was a few weeks ago and I said <clears throat> I don't know, this is aching and that's aching. I don't know if it's something systemic, like Lyme's. And this man said, this doctor, oh, everybody thinks they have Lyme's. It, that's like yeah. crazy to me. So I'm looking yeah. for another yeah. physician. And um, I have another question. Uh, my dogs are on tick preventatives, and I used to use the topical. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I sleep with the dogs, and I said, I wonder if I'm getting protection from sleeping with these dogs. I don't know. I changed to the uh, oral kind, which doesn't ki kill them. It just uh, repels them. I mean, it does kill them, but it doesn't repel them, which means it could come in with a tick, and I could get it. So is there anything being developed for humans as a preventative? Uh, there is a vaccine that's in development for Lyme disease. It's in phase phase two clinical trials right now, and I think you have to get through four phases. It's being developed by a European company. Um, I don't, I didn't put it, make it as part of the presentation tonight. I don't have. It's in France, I think. Yeah, I don't have a lot of hope that it's going to come out to market anytime soon. Another thing is, I heard that both guinea hens and possums <clears throat> like to eat ticks. Yes. So can we just? Get a whole bunch of those running around. <laughs> so I understand what you're saying about if you take the one dose of doxycycline, it could maybe mask symptoms. But what about if you take that and then follow up with the blood test? The blood test is probably going to be the more important part of it, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess. You'll still know what, what you have. That's yeah. What I also okay. feel like as consumers, you know, it's our job to be uh, assertive if we have to with the providers because I recently had a tick embedded and right away, I called my doctor and she called the prescription in for the uh, doxycycline. She called me back, she said, now you go get the blood test. So she wanted both, and I respect her for that. But then she also said, by the way, it's only 30 to 50% effective. There's also so. a really nice um, reference manual for providers that comes out of the CDC, mm -hmm. and they publish it every year, and it's, it's really beautiful. It's standardized. You have to have an attitude that it's a problem. If I want to read that. But for mm -hmm. doctors who may be not online, um, I have gone over to the offices and dropped it off. But, so if you have somebody in particular, I could always drop off material. Yeah, yeah. About yeah I, I just, I understand the need for protection from the ground. Um, mm -hmm. If you're out and you're hike, hiking around like in the woods, mm -hmm. do you also have to, do ticks live in trees and leaves? I mean, do down. they drop down yes. on you? No. So that's one. Is that a myth? That is, they that's do. a myth. They do? I've had them drop down on me. So, so ticks, so the way that ticks attach to, to people or animals is a process called questing. So they get out on the edge of a blade of grass or a, a low branch or something, and they stick their two front appendages out. I had some great pictures I had to cut out of this one. Um, they stick their front appendages out and they wait for you to physically brush by them. And when they do, when you physically brush by them, that's when they can attach. They're not built like fleas, so they can't jump on you. And they detect whether or not um, a human or an animal is coming by through your carbon dioxide emission. So if, you're, if they're way high up in a tree, there's no way that they're going to be able to tell that you are walking beneath them. But they really they need to be in your brush. Yeah, they, they need to be in close proximity, proximity to you. And that's, so, you know, so one I reason. I had one drop down from a tree onto my hand, so it just happened to drop down. It wasn't like... It, yeah. I don't think it was seeking you out, no. <laughs> yeah, like that. But that's one reason why we really encourage people to, you know, go out and do all the things that you like to do, go hike and whatnot, but you can really reduce your risk of encountering a tick and getting a tick-borne disease by staying in the center of a trail. Because the center of a trail is nice and beaten down, and there's not much, you know, br all the brush and the taller grass is on the sides, and that's where the ticks are going to be. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you can stay in the middle of the trail like that, and I realize it's not always possible, particularly if you've got a dog or someone else you have to run after, um, you can reduce your risk of, mm -hmm. of encountering a tick that way. That really works, because I, I hiked Putney Mountain, this was like a few years ago, and... Uh, 
no, no, no ticks, nothing. And then I went off the trail out into the brush, like you say, and I got them on my legs. <laughs> yep, that's where they like to be. Yeah. Well, I don't go out hiking. And a couple of years ago, <clears throat> I was fairly sick with the health condition I have. So three friends came over and took me out to Burdick's for lunch. All three of them have dogs. When they left me and I went to take my shower that night, there was the tick. How uh, they come from people to people. Yeah, it's possible. It's it's possible if a tick gets onto you or if it gets onto say a dog, it's it's happy. Yeah. Okay, it's gonna it's it's got a host that it can feed on and it'll be happy. So if they move very slowly, the black-legged tick in particular, so they're not going to run the risk of getting off of one host and moving on to another one. But we do know, for instance, that pet owners are at greater risk for tick-borne diseases than people who don't have pets. So your dog might come inside with a tick that's attached or starting to get attached, and your, your dog does this on the couch and happens to knock the tick off, and then you sit down to watch TV that night and the tick says, ah, here's somebody else and can attach that way. Yeah. But generally they're not going to go from one host to another because that's just too risky Well, they for carry them. dogs in their car, all three of those women, and, the, and I'm sitting in the car. I mean, oh, I, I, it didn't fall Finger. out of a tree for sure. Probably got <laughs> Hi, um, I am good friends with Debbie and I lived with, with um, her having re-succumbed to Lyme two winters ago, and she, she was paralyzed practically. It was horrible, horrible, horrible. It's a lot of fun. And then, I'm sorry, sweetie. <laughs> and then, um, so I was very tick aware. I bought a house up on Hickory Ridge Road by a babbling brook, and I was so thrilled. Um, couldn't get TV reception, so I had a tree guy come, and he goes, you know, I can treat your land for ticks. And I said, well, good. And he goes, but not now. Um, this was fall. And he said, we'll have to do it in the spring. And then I had him come, I talked to him again. And he said, well, when I kill them, it's $200. And it's just for that day. They're going to come right back. I'm what? like, well, that really sucks. No offense, sorry. But it was not a good answer. Yeah. Um, in November, I buried my pet in my garden. And um, I, I had... I found two ticks on me within two days, went to doctor um, and uh, the urgent care place, got my doxycycline, and by Christmas, I could barely move. I was just really, really weak and tired. Um, and I called my doctor and she said, well, I can't see you till January. And whatever, by January 26th, she re had referred me to a hematologist because my blood count was so low. I had anemia, and I mean, hemolytic anemia, pneumonia. I was put into the hospital instantly. She had to take me. I couldn't, I, I didn't, couldn't You're get- You're Amy, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh my you know, God, I yeah. am famous. No, if we could talk, we I, I don't want to stop you, but if I, we could talk afterwards too, I'd like to, I wanted to catch up with you. Okay. She's the I, famous one. I tried to stop it. I did all the way through. Uh, yeah, she took. She wrote a, wrote down on the list of Please what to ask the doctor Amy about for these diseases, and, and I gave her a note. They put me right in the hospital. I was mm -hmm. there for five days, being treated with doxycycline, but by the fifth day, they did a um, a slide test of yeah. my blood, yeah. and I had babesiosis. I, I think yeah, one of here one of the three here. in the state. Today, I got released from my doctor's care six months later mm -hmm. that I am all back to normal. And I'm fine, everything's oh. good, but I don't want to garden anymore and I'm very <laughs> sad, so. Yeah. Yeah. So what is the state doing, if, if you know anything at all in terms of killing the ticks? In terms of killing the ticks, there is nothing out there that's been shown to be effective at killing, t at killing ticks that reduces the risk of tick-borne diseases. So as Amy was saying, you can spend a lot of money, $200 is on the lower end for what I've heard, to um, kill the ticks in your yard, but that is a temporary solution. The ticks are simply, new ticks are simply gonna come back. And you know there have been large scale studies done that have shown you can reduce the, you can do all these sort of environmental things you can spray you know, your yard, you can clear out all the leaf litter, you can get rid of your bird feeders, you can do all of these things to reduce your risk of getting 
a tick-borne disease, um, but none of them have actually shown to work. The only thing that's actually been shown to work, and the reason why we put so much emphasis on this, are these personal protective measures. So checking for ticks and removing them and um, actually bathing, which is why we do shower cards, bathing afterwards are the techniques that have been shown to reduce your risk of contracting a tick-borne disease. It's, it's perplexing, it's frustrating, but there is nothing out there that says you can do this and it is going to eliminate the tick population or re significantly reduce the tick population to such an extent that you're gonna reduce your risk. Um, part of this is like you can do all these things in your yard, but nobody lives exclusively in their yard. So if you happen to go somewhere else and you pick up a tick, you know, you've just basically zeroed out everything that you did in your, um, you know, on your property. So I think if there was something that was shown to be scientifically um, efficacious that's going to reduce people's risk of contracting a tick-borne disease by eliminating the tick population, you know, I can't imagine that, you know, people wouldn't want to do that. The part of the problem is, and I only had one slide to devote to, to this, is that this is such a complex issue that involves, you know, how we've, you know, modified the landscape. You know, we, this, our forests now are really fragmented. And so that creates an environment where there's relatively low biodiversity that allows a lot of like white-footed mice mm -hmm. to exist. There's not a lot of predators for, the, for them in these little fragmented forests. Um, they're the best reservoir for, for Lyme disease. Um, and then we've surrounded ourselves, you know, our houses are inside, you know, these little fragmented forests or our backyards abut forests. And so we've created uh, an environment where we've sort of poured gasoline on the issue where, you know, the, the reservoir for the ticks and the ticks themselves can be incredibly abundant. And then we go out and spend a lot of time in that environment. So until we sort of unravel this and find out, you know, what we can do, education, awareness, personal protective measures are where we're, you know, we're putting our eggs at the moment. Tom, do you have a question? Yeah, I just, been, I was wondering because, uh, you know, I mean, maybe 10, 15 years ago, I remember go out, used to go out in the woods in the fields, hang out, lay out there, and mm -hmm. never get a tick. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, is, is the influx of them in that, Climate change. you know, uh, no. Once quick, all of a sudden now we got this many, or were they this there before, but you just never you know, had any problems with them? Um, I, you know, I, I don't have a good answer to that. I know that we have seen that there are parts of the U.S., Vermont included, where there were, where there were no black-legged ticks before, and now there are. Um, so I heard somebody mention climate change. There are people who think that climate change could play a role in some of this. There's probably a lot of different reasons. What really speaks to me um, you know, this bacteria and the tick for Lyme disease was here before, before we were, but this was all a big contiguous forest that didn't support, you know, it supported a lot of different creatures that weren't all really good reservoirs for this bacteria. We clear cut this entire area, you know, the Northeast, and over time it's been reforested, but again, in a fragmented sort of way, and we've sort of dotted ourselves in there um, so again, we've created this environment where a really good reservoir for these diseases, the white-footed mouse, can make its home there. Um, there aren't a lot of, um, you know, the, the tick can make its home um, in the leaf litter and the landscaping that we provide. And then, you know, again, our houses, mine included, you know, are surrounded by these kinds of woods and stuff. And so I think that that has definitely played a role in why we're seeing this increase in tick-borne <clears throat> diseases over the last 30 years. I know it's, it's been sooner in Vermont, but, you know, Connecticut and the rest of the Northeast, we're seeing this, Pennsylvania, um, before we were. Why did they start in the beginning calling it a deer tick? Great question. Thank you. That was another one of my slides. I love this story. Mm -hmm. So they used to think that it was the deer tick and the black-legged tick, that they were two different species. But then when they started doing some you know, molecular testing and looking more closely, they said, oh my gosh, it's actually the same tick. And it's called Exodes scapularis. The, 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 the name scientifically accepted is the black-legged tick, but you still do hear 
deer tick quite a bit. And we, because it's scientifically accepted, we use deer tick, or I'm sorry, black-legged tick, but also <clears throat> um, people ascribe way more responsibility to deer being part of this problem because of the connotation with the deer tick. Yeah. The deer are really important for adult ticks to feed on, and that's where adult ticks like to procreate. Um, but they're not as important at spreading Lyme disease as, say, the white-footed mouse. Typically, the, the mouse, that, the sort of pest mouse um, is not, that lives in homes with us is sometimes not the white-footed mouse. It depends upon where you live. If you live with woods around you and stuff, sure, the white-footed mouse can get in there. Um, so it's, it could be the white-footed, it could be the deer mouse. Um, but hey, they like to live, you know, around kind of where we are in woods and they love bird feeders and all the other acorns and whatnot that we have in our yard. It's possible. You know, it really is true. I agree that years ago we didn't have them. Yes. And it was not that long ago. And I've heard stories about the people going and shooting deer down south and then bringing the carcass up and we got them that way. And I've also noticed that years ago, we did not have a possum in Vermont. And they've come up from the south. They've migrated, as probably the weather maybe has gotten warmer. But years ago, and not that many years ago, I was out there all the time cutting brush <clears throat> and traipsing through and never, never got a tick. Yeah, I hear that story, well, that same tick? story a lot. Yeah. Question? Uh, it's, it's not so much, much a question, it's an observation, and it's probably stating the obvious as to what a, a serious and widespread problem this is for humans, and especially those of us who live in rural areas, because I'm listening to these stories and know a lot of people who've had these diseases, and it changes your way of life. I mean, we're talking about people who we don't want to garden anymore, we don't want to go out in our yards, we don't want to do brush, we don't want to hike, we don't want to walk. And so what it's doing, it's not only changing our way of life, you know, how we live our daily lives, it's changing the culture. Get a kayak. <laughs> I've been trying to figure out what the change has been, because like he said, when I was, I was born in the 40s, I didn't get a tick on me until the 90s. Mm -hmm. and we rolled in the woods. First time I found a tick on me, I was turkey hunting on the edge of a field. And now it's gotten so you can't even walk through a field yeah. without mm -hmm. getting on them. And I tried to figure out what the heck has changed. And the biggest thing I could think of was they stopped burning the fields in the spring. Mm -hmm. They get those little sacks on the edge that they hatch out of, the ticks. Mm -hmm. uh, is that a possibility, why they're so infested here now? Because there's no more field burning. That's, I haven't heard that before. That's a good question. Yeah, I know that burning is an important part of the ecosystem out west yeah. in particular. I have not heard that for out east here. So that's, that's something I could look into. That's a good question. One of the things, that, just talking to Jack Mannix at Walker Farm, <clears throat> Jack said when he first started farming here, you could pretty much guarantee mid-September to the end of the month you'd get a killing frost. Yeah. And in 40 years, it's moved a month up. Actually, where, or two. Mm -hmm. or, or more. So I can't help but think climate is, is, yes, it is, certainly plays is, is a factor and here. We're trying to get our cold weather to get a snow cover. Yeah. And I think that really insulates them. So. The data doesn't really support the change in temperature to that extreme. But. Yeah. <clears throat> they, they think that that's it's a good point for the moose tick. You know, the moose in Vermont and the Northeast are being decimated by the moose tick and they think it's that exact reason is that the you know the moose tick becomes inactive after you have a hard frost or it gets below a certain temperature and as that as that date has moved back the tick is out there more often and can encounter more tick more more moose the problem with the black-legged tick is that this thing is so hardy that even if it's we get a hard frost and then two weeks later it's above freezing, this thing will come back out and try to feed again, even on a warm day. I've been deer hunting up north in November when, when the season opens. Mm -hmm. 
and they've got eight inches of snow up there. And now the moose have still got ticks on them. Mm -hmm. And they're dying off at a good rate, too. Yeah. So I don't think it's uh, climate change. Huh. Well, Betty, I did think you? that part of the, sorry, part yeah. of the frustration um, with your presentation, and I think the approach that we see so often, is that we keep hearing what we are supposed to do personally about mm -hmm. the ticks. And, right. and I think our feeling is we need to do more environmentally about the ticks. We can't do anything about climate change at the moment, unfortunately or fortunately or whatever. But what, I think what people are really looking for is what can we do to affect our environment? Now, I, I was just about to start stuffing cotton balls with permethrin in tubes uh, to do the tick tubes for the mice. Uh, and it sounds like you're saying, Forget it, it's all completely ineffective. And, and there was the thing about putting out the deer stand so that the deer would rub against the permethrin um, things. Mm -hmm. Also, I mean, it seems that because people have decided to focus on personal responsibility, there is a total abdication of, of, right of focus mm -hmm. on these kinds of things that maybe if we worked cooperatively, we could actually it, reduce. That's one of the reasons we're Thank here. Thank you, I appreciate that. I think we that. want to start that process. Right. Yeah. And, and we're starting from scratch, but here we are. And, and I'd, I'd like to see if we can grow this. Because if we don't, idea. we'll just treat it in September. You, you bet. Yeah. What's yeah. the point of I have one more question. How long will a tick live without being nourished by blood, whatever, you know? They, do they know that? We I mean, like if the ticks are. The black legged tick is going to live for two years, and they are they're going to feed for three times during that that two years. So um, it they if and it say like the adult tick comes out in the fall to feed. If they don't happen to get a meal in the fall, they can overwinter and try to get a meal early in the spring. So they can go. They can't go forever because that's a significant way that they get a lot of their water. Is through their their blood meal, but they can they can last for quite a while. Wow. And but just to your point, I think a lot of the reason why we focus on the personal protective measures is because it's the only thing that's been shown to be effective. There is a big study underway in Dutchess County, New York, where they're looking at a very widespread landscape modification, or they're putting out these boxes where kind of like you're saying with the tick tubes, where a mouse or a chipmunk will go in. They'll get sort of like, you know, this permethrin treatment on them that'll kill ticks. And then they're um, also using a fungus to spread to spray on um, the kind of uh, places where ticks might quest that will then kill the ticks. So there are people out there who are looking at widespread, you know, landscape modifications that you can make. Um, but until we know that that's been shown to be effective at reducing people's risk, you know, we're just hesitant to recommend that people do this. The box that they're using in this study, it's called the T TCS, the Tick Control System. I think one box is like a couple hundred dollars, maybe three or four hundred, and you need to put multiples of them in your own yard, and you need to pay a licensed person to come out and do it. Um, so, you know, there's there's pros and cons, you know, for all of this that we're just waiting for the evidence to come out on. And that's where it comes back around to the legislature because then what you're looking, what people are looking for is some sort of maybe financial support or incentive right. to have this be a statewide um, mm -hmm. program. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a corporate effort is going to be that next step. Yeah. Um, there were at least one study I know of that was, I think, done in Connecticut about the mm -hmm. correlation with Barbary, which obviously was not something that we saw of in the 40s and 50s. Um, it is an invasive species. It does pre prevent or pr provide a good habitat for the mice um, and also keeps shelter of the ground, which keeps the ground moist underneath it. Um, I think it's only one study, you know, and you know how it is. One study doesn't necessarily yeah. Yeah. indicate that it's causal, but it, it is a correlation. Yeah. I've seen the taxidermist pull a hide out of the freezer. And then the ticks start crawling off yeah. in the hide. Yeah. Oh. And I did, I've seen a possum when I was a kid, five years old. He had his head stuck in a jar yeah. trying to get the mayonnaise out of it. So they've, they've been around. I was, I was raised in Hinsdale, which is a... It's south of Putney. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not that far, though. Ten minutes. Joking. M, 
You've yeah. got, got a question. Does permethrin kill other insects or just ticks? It can, it'll kill other insects, which is why um, it, it's effective against mosquitoes. So you can use it both. We're getting into the season where mosquitoes, you know, they've already been bad this year as a nuisance, but you know, the, the risk from mosquito-borne disease is gonna start getting up there as we get into July and August. Uh, so yeah, it's effective against mosquitoes as well, but they're not as likely to get on your clothes as a tick is. You know, the mosquito's gonna go right for your skin because you know, they wanna feed really quickly. Where I is that tick? I have a question tick? about that feeding and the tick on me. Mm -hmm. Say hi have a tick on me mm -hmm. and it feeds. And it, how long is it gonna stay on me to feed if I don't see it? Will it drop off? Uh, will it have to feed again? What, how does that go? It'll feed on you for probably, if you leave it there or you don't notice it, it'll feed for a couple of days, yeah. maybe four. Yeah. Um, and then it's gonna drop off. And if it's an adult and it's a male, it's gonna drop off. Uh, well, the adult males really don't feed that much. If it's a female adult, they're gonna drop off, they're gonna lay their eggs and then they're gonna die. If it's a nymph, which is the kind that's out right now and is really, you know, drives a lot of the Lyme disease we see in the state, um, they're gonna drop off of you, use that blood meal to molt into an adult for about two months, and then they're gonna come back out in the fall and they're gonna to try to feed again. The one and only picture you had in the first slide, mm -hmm. it, it looked red, and I, I've had ticks on me and I've had them embedded and I've never, I've never seen a red tint. Yeah, that was a female black-legged tick. We've got, um, on our tick card, we've got pictures of some other ticks. Oh, you yeah, Debbie's got her painting. I'm working on a book about Lyme disease, and I've been painting ticks. So if you'd like, if you want to get make yourself really nauseous, paint ticks. Judith was asking, um, you know, are there natural predators for the tick, other insects or whatnot? You know, the 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 possum will is pretty effective at um, you know removing ticks from itself and eating them. But the question was, are there other states who are doing, you know, some sort of wide scale? Um, intervention. And aside from the study that's taking place in, in New York, looking at this, um, uh, New York State Governor Cuomo is doing um, a program this year where they're spraying state lands with, um, I don't know what kind of chemical they're using, but uh, they're only doing it on, on state-owned land, um, hoping to, you know, knock back the tick population there. Is that effective? There's been nothing that's shown that it's going to reduce people's risk of getting a tick-borne disease. It does kill ticks. It does kill ticks. It's temporary. Um, you know, you, you, it's weather dependent as well. Um, you got to be spraying in a place where people are going to be to encounter the ticks. So it's it's a pretty tricky thing. Like with the mosquitoes, we had you know Tripoli e here in the state a couple of years ago, 2012. And those mosquitoes are very um, localized to a particular area. And so you can go and target them with a spray in one you know, particular place and knock the population back. Um, you know, ticks are so widespread everywhere from you know, the, in the middle of the Green Mountain Forest to your backyard that you know, that same approach can't, can't be taken with it. So. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, it was related to um, what you kind of just said about. I was going to ask if, if it's thought been thought about to spray, permethrin. Is that how you say it? Permethrin. Yeah. Permethrin. I mean, I don't want to find you out down the road. It was like DDT with some other bad, really things. But uh, is that a thought in this state? I don't think permethrin is. There are other compounds out there. Um, Part of the problem is that they kill, that if you spray, depending upon what you use, it's gonna kill a lot of um, beneficial um, arachnids in particular, like spiders. Um, so, you know, again, there's, a, there's an upside and a downside to it. Um, so I'm not aware, there's no particular plans in Vermont to do that kind of thing. My understanding, and I saw your slide with all the animals, it's the mice, but it's also birds are carrying it, and they're carrying it up the river corridors. Um, so I'm wondering if you've found that there's more Lyme disease along the river corridor in Wyndham County than up in the mountains. Um, generally, um, so what we would need to do that would be, uh, we need to look at the tick population itself rather than the people, because generally most of the people in Wyndham County live towards 
the the the, um, the the river there. So we actually just started um, a, a pretty big tick surveillance project this year. We're hoping to continue it for the next couple of years, and it would answer something like that, whether or not the tick population is different, you know, away in towards the valleys um, than it is away from them. Generally, ticks like, you know, moist, warm environments. So um, a river valley like that is actually a really good place to encounter ticks because the microclimate there is pretty suitable for them. So I'm still confused, mm -hmm. having been a couple of years ago um, diagnosed with Lyme. I mean, I went to the Brattleboro Memorial Hospital, got the test, and the doctor did, because we found a tick on me. He said I had Lyme, gave, gave me the medicine, but not for the 30 days that a lot of people, I don't remember taking it for 30 days or whatever. I felt weird symptoms a couple months later. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of ticks around my house, my dog, I don't know. Um, I convinced his nurse to, that I felt like I had these symptoms, so she signed me up to go get a test again at the hospital. Mm -hmm. and he called me up on that Sunday and he was furious that I went to go get that test again because he said it was expensive. And I already, once I had Lyme, I had it. So that wasn't going to tell me anything. I, I found a tick under my arm. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it was there, you know, probably a while. I got rid of it, and I didn't, I didn't do anything okay. about it. Am I supposed to do something about it every time you find a tick on you? The recommendation of the health department is if you find a tick attached to you, you should watch your, monitor your health for 30 days for some of those symptoms that we talked about tonight. If you get sick, then you go see your healthcare provider and get diagnosed and get treated. Because um, if, you, if you go to your provider before you're symptomatic, you're probably gonna end up negative for a lot of the tests, not only the Lyme one. Right, that's what they say. Mm -hmm. That's what they yeah, okay. Once you have Lyme, you always have Lyme, or you're more susceptible when you get it again to keep, have it worse? You can get Lyme disease multiple times. There's nothing, there's no immunity that you develop to it. But no, people can get Lyme disease, you know, have a really bad acute illness, get diagnosed and treated, and that's it. They're done with Lyme disease. Um, in your particular case, what it sounded like they were referring to is that the, the test for Lyme disease, it measures your antibodies. And so a couple of months later, after you were acutely sick and you're feeling kind of bad again, and they test you again, you could just be showing antibodies to your previous Lyme infection. You're still going to have them. So the te maybe your doctor was saying that that test isn't going to tell you very much because it could just be positive from your previous infection. Okay. That could be it. Could right. be it. We have the last question because Brad's got a long way home. I hear a lot about the doxycycline and um, after being uh, undiagnosed for more than a decade, probably two decades, I went to Sojourns and I used uh, their protocol which was not using antibiotics, which was using their um, more n uh, naturopath, homeopathic based um, procedure and protocol and it did work and I am clear and free and it felt tremendously better and healed um, and the interesting part that I knew that it was working was that there was die-off immediately I could feel feel the die-off of the bacteria within my system so there they were the first providers that took me seriously and this is after having symptoms for over 20 years uh, so I was really happy to know that that was also a resource um, so we do have a variety of approaches, but that was something that personally worked for me. Will any antibiotic work on this? Anyone? Any, no. Yeah. Uh, no. The, the first line treatment is doxycycline. There are other um, antibiotics in the tetracycline family. What's the second one they go to for kids? Um, but no, not any antibiotic will work. <clears throat> Bradley, I want to thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, no, thank you, everybody, for coming out and great questions. And, and Kathleen from the Brattleboro.
Department of Health. Uh, hopefully we won't have to come see you, yeah. but yeah. if you do, there's someone there. Um, what I'd like to ask, um, it was great that you could share and take questions from people. If people have experiences they want to share, uh, it would help me to start to make the case with other legislators that this is a problem that needs the kind of attention it's not getting. Mm -hmm. um, if you could email me your story, write your story. Uh, if you don't have my, most of the Putney people know how to get in touch with me. If you don't want to, I can give you my card with my email. Um, I think we're starting from scratch to build the case and the way we, we get to a place where we uh, can get enough people to say this is a problem that needs uh, is to get people's experience, to get people's testimony, and then to understand this is a problem, how big is the problem, what are the solutions? And, and we're, we're, it feels like we're at the start, even though most everybody here has been through the whole process themselves. So it would help me as a next step if, if you have a story to share, if you can email it to me, write it to me, uh, that would be a great next step. Uh, and what I've, just like what Amelia shared, there's no one thing that works for everybody here. If you have ideas that have worked for you, have, that haven't worked, that would be helpful too, because I think we're trying to build a, a knowledge base here. So thanks again for coming out.